Ladies and gentlemen, to Mr. Ashwini Agrawal, head of BFSI at Credence. Good morning, everyone. Audible? Yes. Awesome. So, good coincidence. Beyond is the title, and what you saw about Credence is also beyond possible. So, beyond, beyond sort of rhymes well. Uh, the way you can read beyond possible is in two ways beyond possible, which means look beyond what is possible today, but it also means making the beyond possible, right? And the theme for today uh, that we have chosen is solving for the AI in Gen, a in Gen AI, right? And Gen AI is the most talked about, you know, word and associated phrases with it uh, in last one year or so. And there's a reason why I've put AI under quotes, because what I'm going to talk about is truly going to be about how do we make the beyond possible in Gen AI? What is the beyond in Gen AI now that we have seen the year 2023 that we did? Uh, I leave one question with all of you. Uh, why is the AI under quotes? I look to have that unravel as, we, as I take you through some of the presentation that I have here. But yeah, if any of you have thoughts, suggestions, please think through and maybe I'll ask towards the end of the presentation. Okay. It's so much of, you know, solid things that our friend Samir talked about. Uh, as professionals in data analytics AI space, we are always close to technology and technology excites me. You know, in India, we don't have Tesla on our roads, but as I was visiting, meeting clients in, in the US, in Dubai, in Singapore, I realized Tesla is actually on roads. And I was trying to recall, you know, about five years back when driverless cars were being thought of as one of the big innovations and uh, customers really had apprehensions. How do I bring it on road? Is it safe to drive? Is it costly? Will it dig a hole in my pocket? And any new technology typically believes you make, uh, makes you believe that beyond is possible, but then it has challenges that you need to solve for. Tesla brought together world-class technologies together to solve for it, and you actually have Tesla cars on road now. The reason I say that is, you know, one of the biggest tech breakthroughs that we saw in 2023, as Samir talked about, and as all of us have experienced, has been Gen AI and LLMs in our space, the data and AI space. And all of us have encountered different kinds of words, and this is a word cloud where you, know, you would see different words that you would have encountered, not necessarily in you know, technical terms, but these are the words that you would have mostly encountered in various forms for foundational models, for how do you fine tune them, you know, how do you control for security? How do you store them in vector databases? All of that. And by the way, it is still evolving each day. As you do that, let me pick one specific piece that probably a lot of us have thought about. It has been the most spoken and most explored, uh, so to say, RAG. Retrieval Augmented Generation. It almost promises to be the be-all for the next wave of productivity benefits. Connecting back to what Samir was saying on, it has to drive tangible benefits, be it you know, productivity for a customer support guy on the floor, it could be an underwriter uh, you know, who's trying to underwrite loans, uh, it could be a you know, policy maker, but how do I give, you know, give productivity benefits to organizations? However, as enterprises are trying to now move on from the year of concept testing into 2024, where they are trying to make enterprise use cases you know, come to ground, reality really hits. You know, when you see, when you understand what will it take uh, for those use cases to see the light of the day. Especially working with banks, you know, the, the data security side of things, you know, what you can do, cannot do based on regulators, is even more proliferated. So let's look at RAG. 
what rag promises was this, right? Simple, and all of us now understand this diagram in some form. Different source information in forms of PDFs, CSVs, PPTs, multimodal is now consumable. You can load and extract that data, divide them into chunks, embed them into a vector database, and make sure that an incoming query can be you know, matched with those embeddings to search for relevant chunks and then you summarize the information back to the, to the user or the, to the person who asked that query as an answer. So sounds fairly simple, sounds like blocks that we have figured out. But as you saw with Tesla, things that seem simple at first, some Lego blocks put together on your left-hand side, and it, it almost feels like, oh, no, I know how to put those Lego blocks together to make a car. But then to actually make it come on the road, you have to figure out what is the engine behind it. And it can become surprisingly complex when you're actually talking about that scale or making, talking about how do you do it for an enterprise use case. So what I did uh, for this presentation is simplify those layers of a RAG solution to say, what is happening? I still remember you know, one uh, when machine learning hit all of us maybe eight, 10 years back. And, we used to do GBM, and uh, uh, in one of the discussions early in the day, somebody said, oh, GBM can handle, gradient boosting can handle all the data. Just put data in it. You know, why do you need to do anything else? But data needs to be managed. And we have figured out now how to use GBM, for example. So managing data that exists in our ecosystem, and if you are talking about large language models, you want to be able to deal with unstructured data, how do you extract that information? How do you chunk that? How do you embed that? There are many more things. I have not written them just for this you know, discussion or presentation. But really, it's about organizing the data in a manner that when a search query comes in or you know, somebody asks a question, I can rephrase, paraphrase that question in a manner where I can search for the right answer and send it back to the, you know, uh, the person who has queried it for the right appropriate answer. Now these layers, you understand for these enterprise use cases, these layers need to be addressed for them to be effective and accurate. So I cannot get an answer which is 50% or let's say 70% there when I'm trying to underwrite a loan for a customer. And I'm from a lot of BFSI backgrounds, so I'll probably take some BFSI examples as I look to explain this. As I was saying, underwriting, let me take an example of loans. All of us take loans. Let's say if I'm talk, take, talking about SME loans and an underwriter, what an underwriter needs to do. If I'm trying to create an underwriter co-pilot, I am essentially trying to say an underwriter can, doesn't need to go through a lot of policy documents. He doesn't need to go through you know, financial statements that a customer may have submitted. He doesn't know, need to go through company documents that you know, the SME may have submitted, et cetera. Oh, sorry. I was looking at the wrong screen. So, so he, he essentially has to then look at, he has to ask questions to a bot rather than himself going to look for those documents and information, and he expects to get that answer. Now, although the intent of different underwriters is the same on evaluating a, you know, an SME for his financial position, his company's position, external macro risks, et cetera, the way that person will ask questions will be different based on his vintage, based on the kind of loan he's underwriting, based on uh, the location that he may be focusing on. You know, San Francisco will be very different compared to Nevada, for example. So I still want to make sure that the intent is what gets searched for. Because you don't want to search for 100,000 questions in your database or answers to those 100,000 questions in your database when you know that probably the intent is only 500. And then some of these questions may be you know, multi-hop. Somebody is not just asking, OK, tell me whether somebody has a, has this SME put a collateral? He's actually asking, tell me the risk of the collateral. So you have to first figure out whether, whether there is a collateral, and then tell me you know, details about that collateral. So being able to translate that query into something that can fetch, me, fetch the right answer. So you have to solve for when, I, when you talk about these you know, 
boxes. You have to solve for some of these things as we look to implement this. The next bit is now you have to make sure that you know the documents, financial documents, for example, that have been submitted, and the company documents that have been submitted are chunked in the manner where the context is preserved. So think about a manufacturing company versus a trading company that somebody is trying to underwrite, and the context about that company gets split into two different chunks, and you are actually finding both of them relevant and trying to pull information from both of them, trying to confuse you know, you know, uh, the hell out of the LLM that is trying to give the right answer. So how do you chunk maintaining contextual integrity is very important. Embeddings. Now, some of these embeddings need to be done in a manner where the, I call embedding as indexes, right? The indexing is done in a manner where the query can search for it. And that indexing, how do you do that in a domain-specific manner is also very important. Else, a question being asked may not find the right answer. Now, finally, you have done all that. You have searched the right chunks. You now want to understand how do you get the right answer from it. So you want to do the right prompt engineering, uh, but that prompt engineering also is, you know, needs to be fine-tuned for templates, or not fine-tuned, you need to be assessed for the templates that will give you the right answer. Uh, for example, uh, when you say statements in a legal firm, that means somebody actually giving a statement on a specific case. But when you say statement in a banking term, it means a, you know, a statement of you know, financials about the customer. But all of this, I cannot just go after accuracy. I have to make sure the performance is good. An underwriter will not wait for two minutes, three minutes after he's asked his question to get the answer. And cost cannot just keep using chat GPT-4, for example, to get all my answers, because it blows up the cost and sometimes it goes beyond what the ROI may be. For example, when we are doing chunking, chunk size optimization is important, because token size is important, it is critical to cost. Processing time, because the underwriter doesn't want to wait for two minutes, is critical. Managing high dimensionality of embeddings is also critical, because then it impacts the search and hence the performance. And if I'm using prompt engineering, what is the foundational LLM that I'm trying to choose? Again, do I need to go for chat GPT-4? Will some of the open source ones do better? What is that answer? How do, I, how do I manage my token limit, not just for what's being queried, but what's the output? And managing latency. Now, I put some of them on the page just for this discussion. I know I have limited time and maybe running out. This whole matrix looks much more complex, and what I've put on the page is not the full story yet. So enterprise use cases need to solve for them solutions to be effective and accurate, and the trade-off between cost and efficiency is very, very important. But that's not all, folks. What is still very important, again, for you know, industries like banking, for healthcare, etc., it's even more important is being able to do it in a secured and responsible manner. It means data and information security. For example, being able to do the Gen AI security risk map. Am I, be, am I able to encrypt data in a manner where the PIIs don't get exposed? Homomorphic uh, encryptions, for example, are being used. Secure enclaves are being used so that you know, so parameters that are being used for tuning the models are not being exposed anywhere. The APIs that I use, are they secured? Can I do some of the things on my desktop rather than pushing it on the cloud? Privacy by design, if you think of this as I create LLM, LLM ops pipeline, it's not just about how I store data and manage data, it's also about how I use data, use that data across that pipeline. Differential privacy um, you know, on each record so that when that record is being used, you're not necessarily giving away anything about the person or you know, the enterprise that record may be about. Data minimization. Uh, and all of this being integrated in not just deployment, but how you train as well. Uh, and last but not the least, identity access management and security policy. If an underwriter queries about similar last cases, he needs to understand what happened in those cases. He doesn't need to know about who was that guy, what was the email ID, what was the phone number, et cetera, et cetera. All the document that is being queried may have that. So what gets served 
cannot be the phone number of an individual that is not in question. And the LLMs being responsible, which means control for hallucinations, uh, making sure that you know, uh, uh, prompt engineering controls are in place, not just for getting the answers, but also uh, putting controls on hallucinations that may happen on those answers, grading hallucinations to say what is acceptable versus not acceptable, putting ethical guardrails and putting human in loop, uh, and making sure that you know, Gen AI can then learn from that human in loop, and making sure that I go from high guardrail to low, rather than low guardrail to high. Because as you train, chances are that mistakes would happen more often on, you know, uh, in, in the initial period. Uh, and being able to do it in an ex explainable manner. Think about an underwriter declining a loan for a customer using Gen AI and not being able to point out to the customer, this is the document and here is the information that I looked at to be, you know, because of which I declined, right? So in summary, for enterprise use cases, you have to engineer for these layers. If you look at the layers at the bottom, I have added app orchestration as an incremental layer because you need to be able to control for some of these you know, risks that we talked about at that layer as well. But you engineer for these layers, enabling for implementation. To be able to implement, organizations will always ask for, is it effective and accurate? And is it balanced for cost? and efficiency, and adoption, which basically means, am I doing it in a secured and governed manner? It means that we have to design for these layers and make sure that my architecture is designed in a manner that my use cases demand. And the tool choices are being done in a manner where, you know, the costs are in control and it's being done in a responsible manner. So, and and do that at not just deployment stage, but at development stage as well, and make sure that I do post-deployment monitoring. So my, you know, the efficacy is not dropping after deployment, the cost is not blowing up, and some of the breaches on you know, the responsible uh, AI side, data security side is not hurting me. So at Tredence, when we look at, I'll stay at the last slide, when we look at some of these layers and solve for these layers, we're not just solving for the best model to pick, you know, the best fine tuning you can do. We are actually also looking to solve for, when we set data engineers, you know, data scientists, some of the domain specialists together, for how do you do guardrails? How do you make sure cost optimization frameworks are in place, right? And to put all of that together, um, not just those five layers, but something as complex as this, where you are trying to evaluate what is the cost, let's say, of fine tuning versus being able to do, you know, prompt engineering in an effective manner. I'll not go through all of this. We can talk offline if we want to talk about some of these layers, but if you look at some of the security features attached, some of the evaluation features that you see along with, along with uh, the boxes that you see or that we need to solve for, is what is required. Uh, and if you want to operationalize it, making sure that we do it across the data layer, the LLM ops pipeline side of things, taking care of it while developing and deploying, and making sure the security side of things are taken care of at the application layer as well. So what does this mean? I see one and a half minutes left, so I'll look to wrap up. It means that being able to engineer for nuances needed for each of these layers is what separates a toy car from a real car ready to hit the roads. Those layers are really the engine that is there in that real car, and those engines need to be engineered for. So this Tesla, where enterprises, this Tesla is the Gen AI Tesla where enterprises are asking these questions that we discussed about. Engineering the nuances for each of those layers is the secret to adoption and implementation. 
remember we talked about implementation having security side of things and performance uh, accuracy side of things and adoption having responsible and ai responsible ai and data privacy side of things so you have to be able to engineer for those back you know those layers to to unravel the secret of ai adoption and implementation is the ai that i was talking about so for this tesla to hit the road folks let's solve for this ai in janai i'll take a pause and happy to talk offline uh, for anything that you may have or can we take questions we are at the at the end of our no i'll probably take it offline thank you guys and hope this was helpful to set some of our sir i request you to kindly stay back we have a momento for you